Marketer of the Day, Episode 655, WWHW, Why, What, How To, What If. Easily create a book, podcast, or online course in just a few easy-to-follow steps. Hey, it's Robert Plank, and do your presentations sometimes fall flat? Do you have writer's block? Do you have the fear of creating a webinar or giving a podcast interview or publishing a book? Well, I have the answer for you, and it's a formula called WWHW, Why, What, How to, What If. I have a new book out that's all about this at WWHWbook.com, and here's the formula, Why, What, How to, What If. And that means that if you're presenting about something, if you're present, if you're stuck about what to talk about, uh, and so for example, if you were to explain to me how to change the oil in my car, if you just jumped into the steps, I, I would be lost. If you explained to me why it's important to change the oil on my car, I'd say that's great, but tell me how to do it. So by By structuring anything that you're going to explain to someone into this format of why, what, how to, what if, it hits all the right buttons, it makes all the right sense, you can have a fast-paced but also interesting discussion, and you're leaning on this thing called structured creativity, so that way you can put your attention, your focus onto your audience and how they're reacting And if you're writing something or you're planning something, you can put your focus into the fun micro stories, anecdotes, jokes that you're going to put into that presentation instead of agonizing over, do I say this first or do I say that next? Why, what, how to, what if? That means if you're, for example, giving me an instructional article about how to change that oil in my car, first tell me why I need to change the oil on my car. Tell me what happens if I I don't do it and how often I need to do it and just what's involved with it. Then what? Tell me about the different types of motor oil that there are, how to get the right motor oil, how to look up the type of motor oil I need for my car. Tell me about where to go on my car to open it up and drain it. Maybe even tell me about doing it myself versus taking it in for an oil change and why, and why I would choose one over the other. And then now that you've explained to me the principles, walk me through the steps. Tell me about putting out the drip pan and unscrewing something and draining it and, and uh, putting the new oil in and sealing it back up. And then tell me the one if component, which is now that you've taught me this thing and you've given me the steps, what's the next step? So maybe there's something else that's Uh, important about maintaining my car, such as changing the transmission fluid or the wiper blades or the brake pads, or just tell me now that we've solved that problem, what new opportunities or what new possibilities or problems does this now open up for us? So that way we can transition into some sort of a call to action. I'll repeat the structure there. It's why and what then how to and what if. And this is the universal formula. If you are stuck about writing a a web page, a sales page, copywriting, have you heard of this? Let's say that you have an online course and the online course is about how to develop confidence, but you don't know how to sell it. Maybe you're confident in selling it, but you don't know how to say just the right words. Well, instead of worrying about the finer details about this word or that word, think about what the steps are. Think about the journey that you're taking people on because uh, I've looked at hundreds of sales letters and I used to run a course called speedcopy.com where as part of this course, people would send me their web pages and, and I'd pick them apart and give them suggestions on what to change. And I would say that the number one thing that I saw was that they, they weren't sending people from this why, what, how to, what if, uh, just path. They would be missing the what piece or the how to piece or why, what, how to, what if was in the wrong order. And what I want you to do, if you're ever trying to convince me to buy something on a web page, tell me why is it important? In other words, why did I come to that web page to begin with? What's the problem? Give me more of the pain. Unpack 
what what's what it, it is, right? Unpack the place that I'm stuck and then give me the solution. And don't give me the whole solution, but tell me about your product, about your course, about your your e-commerce item that you want me to buy and what's involved with that, what are the pieces? And finally, what if? So tell me now that I have it, what is possible if I get your your kitchen cutter or I get your course on how to get more confident and then tell me how to buy. So why, what, how to, what if? And this applies everywhere. Uh, You're listening to this podcast right now and we have a lot of guests on the show and I, I don't like to think too much, right? I don't like to reinvent the wheel and whenever I have a guest on my podcast, we start off with some really simple getting to know you stuff or I shouldn't say stuff. We start off with the getting to know you phase or topic of the interview. And then as the interview goes on, we get into more of the nitty gritty details. And I realized that sometimes I would have a guest on and we would do too much of talking shop. What I mean by that is let's say I had a search engine optimization expert hop on or a Facebook ads expert. I had someone on the show who already knew the things that I knew or some of the things and I I was afraid of being too simple being too boring but the problem is going back and listening to some of those old interviews we would just jump right in we would just be talking about the steps and we would make some assumptions that people already knew about autoresponders or about Facebook ads or or anything like that and and I realized that we had to sometimes recap and get people caught up about Facebook or about Google or about YouTube or about whatever it was that we were talking about. In other words, we had to give context. We had to ask, why is this important? And at first I was afraid of looking stupid if I asked a question like that, but I said, I would. then I began phrasing it in terms of assuming someone is just now tuning in and they've never heard of Facebook ads, can you really quickly tell us what those are all about? Or if we had a search engine optimization expert, I'd say, well, let's say that some business owner is listening, maybe someone who owns a a diner or or a deli or an Italian restaurant, and they're hearing about this thing called search engine optimization. Why should that local restaurant care at all about search engine optimization? And it was just a small tweak But by doing this in the first few minutes of a podcast interview, that really helped catch everyone up and make our content more accessible. Because I've been looking for the solution for that for years of how to pack in all the good stuff that I I wanted to pack in and not be too slow paced, not be boring, but also not be completely over people's heads. And the answer is WWHW, why, what, how to, what if. And a little bit of a background, I wrote this on my phone, the whole book. I would go for a walk. I'd pull open the Google Docs app on my phone, and then I would type out a couple of pages, or I would type out a chapter as I was walking. I'd have to be really careful to not get hit by a car, and and I'd look up a lot. I I wouldn't be one of those people that was totally engrossed in my phone, but going on those long walks and having that forward motion really helped me to get the words out and get it out in a really compact format. And by the way, our course on how to make a book is called makeaproduct.com. And in that, we teach you how to get a book done in an hour. It takes about 30 or 40 minutes to outline your book and then about an hour to speak out the book. And then it gets transcribed and cleaned up and you go through a few steps uh, to get it onto Amazon. But It walks you through the exact step-by-step process that I used to get uh, that this book online. And I also even have a a chapter near the end of the WWHW book to give you an idea of what's involved in self-publishing a book. Because self-publishing a book on Amazon is free. Amazon would love to sell your book. They just take a small percentage out of the cost of printing and mailing the book. Uh, So Amazon will publish your book in their Kindle digital platform for free. And you can get the WWHW book for whatever I have it priced at right now, 99 cents, a buck 99, only a few dollars because it's digital. There's no printing costs involved. 
You also can get the paperback version and the audiobook version where it was just it's a similar process there where I had the book written and then I busted out the same microphone I'm speaking uh, to you right now and spoke out the chapters, processed it, saved it in a special way, and then uploaded it to the special place in Amazon where they want you to put out a, an audiobook. So there's no reason for you not to listen to the the book on Audible if you're a podcast listener, which, hey, you're listening to this podcast, so you are a listener. But if you're a reader, www.book.com. Anyway, back to the, the point here is that we want to be interesting, but also put in all the information. And ha- putting things into this WWHW format is the way to do it. And so since we're talking about a book, let me explain that process there. So in order to get the, the information that you want to get out there, you need to think about a couple of things. You need to think about what exact problem are you solving and then who are you solving it for? Because if you have writer's block and we all get that, then I would imagine that you probably aren't picturing in your mind the exact person that you're solving this problem for. And what happened with me was, I don't know if your journey was anywhere similar, but when I first got online, I found this web page and that web page and this sales letter and that sales letter, and I ended up on a message board. And nowadays, that would probably be more akin to a Facebook group, but I found a message board. And what was great about those olden days of the internet is once you found the message board where you liked to hang out, you could just get stuck there. And a lot of us would just go to only that site every day that became our start page remember those days of having a home page or a start page in your browser and so many people would just completely live and run their business right there on one of these message boards you wouldn't wouldn't venture outside too much and to be honest there weren't many places to venture outside to and then we would have all these conversations and get ideas about products to sell and sometimes give special deals, offers, discounts to that forum. But at least for me, when I first hopped on to this message board, I saw that a lot of people were asking for these things called website critiques. They'd say, critique my website, check out my new website. And I'd, I would think I was so clever and I would post my link saying, check out my website. Can you tell me what to change? And really, the only thing I was really concerned with was getting people to go to and look at my website and buy from me. And looking back, I think that a lot of those other people who post a so-called website critique were looking for the same thing. They weren't actually looking for maybe a little bit in the way of advice, but they mostly wanted to fool people into going to their website. And it, it was an okay thing to do, I guess. But It didn't produce many results. And then what began happening was we would all copy each other. We would see what sorts of information products, courses, websites, services people would put out. And then we would all do our best to change just enough where it was uniquely ours, but it was, you could tell where the original idea came from. And then, and when that didn't work, then it would turn into what we'd comb the different threads in the message boards and see what sorts of things people were asking about. And they'd say, how do we do this with my website? How do we do this with my marketing? And many times the solution would exist, but it would either be cost prohibitive, right? Too high priced for some of these, to be honest, cheapskate people on the message board, right? They didn't want to pay $2,000 for this or $500 a month for that. They wanted a, a lower cost solution. And I was super young. I was a teenager. So of course I could look at these problems people had and I could whip out a a plugin or a program or a book that would solve their problem. And that was a way better way of going about it. Fooling people into doing the fake website critique, that didn't work. Copying what people were doing, that didn't work because usually I would copy the wrong thing and then someone else would copy me and I would look at what they did versus what I did and they would copy the wrong thing from me. But what worked was finding problems and creating solutions. And also, there was a a double whammy there because not only did finding the problems that people were asking about again and again give me ideas for products that were almost guaranteed to sell, it's also what got me excited again because I'm sure that you've created tons of 
you've created a lot of half finished products, right? You've had an idea for a book or a course and you made half of it and then just gave up and didn't, didn't finish, didn't sell it, didn't have any motivation to. Why is that? Because you didn't have the person in mind that you wanted to help out. Let's say that someone from middle school, high school, college called you up and you were a, a master realtor and they said, help, I need to sell my home. What are the steps? Well, you probably, if you were a, an expert real estate agent, you would know what steps there were to do that. And not only that, but because maybe they were brand new, you'd back up the truck and you'd say, first of all, let's talk about why you would, would want to sell your home yourself or you know, why you w- would want to sell your home. You want to move to a better area or you, uh, you, you're divorced and you need to split up the property or you want to upgrade or downgrade your living situation. You had kids, so you want a bigger backyard and you talk about the reasons why you'd want to do it just to make sure that that person was on the same page. And then you'd say from there, so we just covered the why section. In the what section, you would say, well, I'm about to tell you what you need to know about selling your home. But first, let me throw out a couple of terms for you here. Let's talk about what a real estate agent is. Let's talk about escrow. Let's talk about just the the terms or the concepts that you need to know about selling your home. Let me tell you about what a listing is. Let me tell you about uh, where people come from who are looking to buy your home. Let me tell you about what an open house is. And you would explain just a few of these concepts. So that way the how-to steps would make more sense. And there would be a little bit of repetition, but it's repetition hitting it from a couple of different angles, right? Because you mention it first when you're explaining what it is. And then when you explain how to use it, you're circling back, but it's not too repetitive. I guess you could say it's repetitive in all the right memorable ways. Why is this important? What am I about to tell you, including the concepts and the steps, and then how to do this as you go through each step? And then finally, what if, now what is the the, the new action, right? So now that you've sold your house, well, now it's time to move, or now it's time to buy your next home, or whatever the case may be. And you can apply this to anything from stock trading to weight loss, So if you're explaining the ketogenic diet, you could say, why would you, why why would you, well, a couple of whys, like why would you want to lose weight? Why would you want to keep yourself trim? Well, because you'll look better, you'll feel better, you'll live longer. And then why would you want to choose the ketogenic diet over other diets? Well, it's great for reason one, two, and three, and it's not so great for reason one, two, and three. So that way you can choose if it's right for you. But then what is the ketogenic diet? Well, here is this concept called ketosis. Here is this concept called intermittent fasting. Uh, here's what you need to know about water and fluids and calories and, and the things that you eat and exercise. And then how to do it. What's a seven-day or 30-day or 90-day plan for you to get on and stay on the ketogenic diet? Or I think I've, uh, in specifically about the ketogenic diet, I've heard of some people getting on it for one year. So maybe you could say, as far as the steps, you could say, here's what to do in week one and two, here's what to do in the first month, and then here's what to do for the rest of the year. You can structure it any which way that you want. And then now that you've gotten on the ketogenic diet, now what if? So maybe it's a matter of, uh, and then now here's how to test your your blood sugar levels, or here's how to count your calories, or here's how to know when you track your weight, here's how to know like what a decent weight loss goal is, or uh, if you've been on it for too long, now what, or uh, here's how to watch your inflammation, see how that improves, or you can even get into more advanced topics in that what if section, but I hope that this is making sense, and I think that what, uh, I think that this is the best book I've ever created because in the past, some of the books I've made were, were more like technical manuals, right? They jumped into just some steps and they assumed, for example, in the our double agent marketing book, they just they assumed you, you were already an internet marketer. That really limited my audience. And I think that it's a really interesting and good thought exercise for you to imagine whatever book topic 
that you're you're creating or thinking of creating, how can you make it super duper mass market? How can you make it super simple knowing that maybe the more advanced chapters can be the like the last chapter or two, but really make it drop dead simple if that's an expression. If not, we'll we'll make it one. And and that means that if you are telling someone, say, how to make a million dollars, well, you start in the, the very, very basic beginning. If you tell someone how to master their finances, maybe they don't even have a checking account. Maybe they don't even know some of the, the things that might be simple to you, like paying down their debt or getting a credit card balance transfer, or maybe people need to be educated about uh, spending habits and places to like how to make a budget, how to cut things in their budget. Uh, so you will be shocked and amazed at how many things people don't know. And a lot of people, to be honest, have this whole time been afraid to ask. And I want you to to really think about that and, uh, and apply that, that because we have the internet now, people can now casually search for things that they have been too afraid to ask someone in person. And it would really help for you to go and find these message boards or find these Facebook groups, not for the express purpose of fooling someone to go to your website or your book, because still in that, I mean, if anything, in this day and age, people don't want you to just drop your link any which way that you can. People don't want you to spam them on Facebook Messenger or via cold emails, but it can really help you to look at these Facebook groups, look at these message boards, and look for the problems, look for the questions, look for the repeat problems and questions, so that way you can find those problems and you can create those solutions, and this will get you to the finish line. By helping a specific person, it will get you excited again, because and it, if you think about it, it makes perfect sense, because if you're trying to make that book about weight loss and you don't know who it's for specifically, then you'll just you'll try to write it for everyone. You'll think, well, maybe I'll write it for this type of person or that type of person. No, pick one singular person that you know who would who has or would ask you for advice. If it's your spouse, if it's one of your parents or your friend or whoever, but find a specific person that you would give a step by step plan to. And that's the how to section. And then add all the, the window dressing around that of why is this important? What are you about to, to explain to me? How do I do it? What are the steps? And then finally, what's the assignment? What if this is done? And I, I told you, I would also uh, explain to you how to do this for a book. So here's the process for doing this in a book. And I mean, I know I'm dumping a lot of information here, but don't worry. Inside www.book.com, there's even more cool stuff. So there's no way I can give it all away uh, in, in our discussion here. And there's also some really cool stories, some uh, funny ones, some making fun of me, f making fun of myself that I think you'll like. So check out that book, www.book.com. But how do I structure all my books? I think this is book number 13 of mine. Here's how I do it. Is I, I first keep in mind, what's the problem I'm solving? I imagine in my imagination, that, that makes sense, right? Imagine in my imagination who I'm solving the problem for. And then I list out or I think about 10 questions that someone would ask. And if and keeping in mind that if those 10 questions were asked and then answered, then it would get them from point A to point B as far as what I'm trying to accomplish. And you could say that, that some of those questions could be things like, as far as the ketogenic diet, what foods should I and should I not eat? What do I need to know about exercise? What scientific measurements should I be concerned about? Do I need test trips, for example? So list 10 questions like that, 10 concepts, 10 categories, but list them as questions and list them as, uh, phrase it as if someone was asking you that question. And that's a little bit of a, a mind hack that we explain both in the book and in our makeaproduct.com course. List your chapter titles of, of your make-believe soon to become a book as questions that someone is asking of you. The reason for this is, I mean, there's multiple reasons. Number one is that your brain is trained to answer questions. So if you list it as a question, 
you'll be compelled to answer that question. Reason number two is that it's clear what's being explained. It's clear what the problem is and it's clear what the solution is. So you know where to start and you know where to end. And you know that it has ended. You know that you have solved the problem. You list these 10 questions. You rearrange them in some sort of a logical order, whatever makes sense to you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it goes from easy to hard or goes in chronological order, just what would be something that makes sense. And what really helps with this is a tool called mindmeister.com. Mindmeister allows you to create what's called a mind map, thought bubbles with sub thought bubbles. And then you can drag and rearrange your ideas without having to write a bunch of note cards and put them on a on a table you can just really very quickly drag and rearrange it hooks into google drive and that means that you can get to your mind map from any device you can share it with others and they can help you along with it mindmeister and mind mapping in general is one of the the coolest tools for creativity for getting your thoughts organized for just mind dumping all the stuff mind dumping all the the ideas and chapters, and then rearranging, categorizing, drilling down. By the way, I keep accidentally saying stuff, and I I went to an event with uh, a really smart lady. Uh, I went to an event where a really smart lady named Patricia Fripp was presenting, and she kept saying, don't say tons, don't say stuff, don't say people, right? Explain who are the people. Instead of tons, say, what's the number? Instead of stuff, say what it is. So I keep catching myself if if you're wondering why the heck that is. Anyway, you figure out who you're helping. You figure out what's the problem and what solution is your book providing. Then mind map out 10 questions that this person would ask on the journey such that if all 10 questions were answered, then the problem would be solved. Now, questions one through three or four that you list will be the obvious ones. Questions five, six, and seven will be kind of the dumb ones that you listed just because you had to list 10. And then questions eight, nine, and 10 will be the better questions that you wouldn't have thought of. You would not have thought of these questions unless you went through the rough patch of all those silly, stupid middle questions. And you'll you'll have 10 questions. And some will suck, some will, some will be okay. And what you, I want you to do next, now that you've listed 10 questions, you've put them in a logical order, cross out three. Remove the three weakest questions. And either those questions just are not relevant at all, or if you can't bear to remove questions from your outline, your mind map that's coming together, see if you can combine two questions together and then now you only have nine questions try to combine two more now you only have eight or see if one question that you listed is a little minor and you can just have another question absorb it in and this makes a lot more sense in both the book and in our course i give you some real examples for this and what you've done is you've thought about what who's stuck what's their problem what are you solving you listed 10 questions, you rearranged them, you've reduced down to seven, and then to answer each of those questions, you answer it in why, what, how to, what if format. What I mean by that is let's say that in this outline of your book that's coming together, maybe chapter three talks about body fat percentage, calories, pH levels, and that's where you explain the, the scientific side of the ketogenic diet. And then you, so you begin your chapter. And what you can do now is you uh, extrapolate sub questions. By that, I mean you have this book about the ketogenic diet. Chapter three is about the scientific measuring and testing. And your question for that would be what do I need to know about? scientifically measuring and testing my body's levels with the ketogenic diet. And then now you're branching out from that question and you're creating four sub questions. Can you guess what those sub questions are? If not, I'll tell you. Those sub questions are why, what, how to, and what if. What that means is 
If the title for chapter three was what do I need to know about scientific testing my body, scientifically testing my body for the ketogenic diet, then the first question is why is it important that I scientifically measure my levels for ketogenic diet weight loss? Question two is what terms and concepts do I need to know, such as calories and pH, about scientifically measuring my body? Question three is how do I measure and test my body scientifically? And then the last question is what if I scientifically measure my body? What are the new possibilities in front of me? And then in the book, I explain to then think of three keywords to help you answer each of those questions. And you end up with a detailed structured outline, but then you can, now you can just record and go. And I think that you'll find the information will just flow out of you. And the end result will be that you touch all the bases and you appeal to all the different people that think in certain ways. Because in the preface of the book, we explained that not everyone thinks like you. A percentage of the population is our why, as a why thinker. A percentage of the population are a what thinkers. Some percentages are how to's and some are what ifs. So if you just jump into the how to steps of something, you're only reaching something like 24% of the population. So some people are only concerned or mostly concerned with why is this relevant? Some people are mostly concerned with what are the principles? Some people are mostly concerned with the steps. Some people are mostly concerned with the possibilities once it's done. And then what, once you're done with all that, you can t take one more pass and rename your chapters or rephrase them from questions into just the title of your chapter. No one has to know that your chapter title was, what should I know about measuring my body's level scientifically? You can just rename that chapter to scientific weight loss, pH and calories. And then you can remove those subheadings. And what you end up with is a, a very compact but powerful book that is not too short, not too long. And then if you think about it too, if you, each of your chapters ends in the what if section, talking about the possibilities, next steps, assignments, tasks to be done, then the end of each of your chapters transitions into the next chapter. So once again, why, what, how to, what if, this is the universal formula that appears everywhere. Structured creativity, I'm telling you. Years ago, I was figuring out how to be a copywriter, how to make these things called sales pages, because I thought that that concept was really fascinating. And a sales page is what got me into internet marketing in the first place. It was selling a $200 course that was about how to make basically an info product, how to sell it, how to get consistent traffic for it, and then retire on the beach and only check your stats once every four months. And this web page really sucked me in. And then every time I read a sentence or read a line, it just brought me to the next line, next line, next line. And I thought to myself, if I could structure a book this way and make it fun and entertaining, but also sneak in the good information and make it where it just flowed through and pulled someone from beginning to end, that would be something really powerful. And I think that if you could do this with everything that you do in, a, in an in-person presentation, in a podcast, in a course, in a webinar pitch, if, if you could apply that same principle of grabbing them with something attention getting, which is the why, right? Why am I on this web page? And then uh, aligning with the problem that they're having, which is the what, what problem am I dealing with? And then moving into desire and getting them wanting your solution, which is the how to, right? Here are the steps that we'll go through to solve it. And then at the end, getting them excited about the possibilities once the problem is solved, making them look towards the future. That's the what if or the action section. Well, in copywriting, they said that's attention, interest, desire, action. And we can generalize this to why, what, how to, what if. And if you listen to ads on the radio, you see ads on TV, they all go through this attention, interest, desire, action, uh, I guess, steps or, or phases. But you th can think of this in terms of any presenting or writing or communicating 
in why, what, how to, what if. Why is this important? Context. What are you about to show me? Principles, concepts, big picture overview. How do I solve this problem? The how to, the steps, how to go from point A to point B to get this problem solved. And finally, what if I do this? What happens now? Next steps. This applies to everything. And like I said, if you lean on the structure, the template, then you can devote your energies into the more fun stuff. And you'll be more aware and more mindful about what you say and how you say it. And you'll notice where your weaknesses are. And then you'll also be aware if someone else convinces you to do something or if someone else has something attention getting, whether it's a really exciting book or a course or web page or whatever, instead of being instead of wondering why it worked on you, you could look at, well, did they grab me with was their why or their what or their how to or their what if really strong? And chances are if you look at it in terms of those components, they had all those components and they had all those components in that exact order. So that's really important too. That not only that you cover the why, the what, the how to, and the what if, but you start with the why, it's important. Then you move on to the what are are we about to cover. You go to how to solve this problem. At the end, you get to the what if. And I said, uh, I said it, but I think I didn't complete this loop that we have, uh, I have people on my podcast who I interview, right? And, and I noticed that I would begin by asking someone, well, you have the split testing software. So why should we even care about split testing? What does this accomplish? I I know I just said what in there, but why should we care about split testing? And then they explain, if you split test, then you can do this and this and this. And I said, okay, great. So now what is split testing? So that way, maybe give us the, tell us like exactly what's the, um, what it means, what's the definition, and then maybe give us a little bit of like give us an example. Okay, now that you've now that you've inched into that a little bit more, now how do we apply split testing? What are the steps? How do I what what's like a real example? Uh, like give me a, a little bit of a story and then now that I've split test, now what if? Now what are the the options available to me and how do I buy your split testing software? So I'm hoping that you can see how this uh, this applies again and again. And there's the this proven structure, and then there's also just that concept of being more mindful about your words and about the words not only that you speak, but that are spoken to you. Something that changed my life forever when learning persuasion, marketing, copywriting was I I, I think I listened to an audio CD from I don't know Ben something. I mean, he he's he's definitely not in business now. But this audio CD told me to write a web page with only seven word sentences, no more, no less. And it was a real struggle. But by doing that, I I made sure that there wasn't a word wasted. And I want you to think about that: is what are your crutch words? Not just the ums and likes and ands and sos and words like that, but what words do you use that don't really add anything, that don't really mean anything? And I mentioned Patricia Fripp, who said that we sometimes use words like tons and stuff and people. Well, when if I if my am my book got tons of reviews, is that 60? Is that 10? How many are tons? If you say I help people, do you help business owners, entrepreneurs, single moms? Who are the people that you're helping? If we're going to teach you tons of stuff today. Well, what is the stuff? Am I going to give you tips, ideas, strategies? You sound a lot smarter if you don't lean on these crush words. And I mentioned in past episodes that a couple of years ago, I joined an organization called Toastmasters. And what's really uh, easy for you to do is go to toastmasters.org, click on find a club, put in your city or address, and just find one of these meetings where you can show up, you can just you can show up as a guest. You show up, uh, sit at at a table. Uh, people so, sometimes these are might be in like the back meeting room of a diner or something, but many times it will be in a library or in an office building. So you show up, and they'll they'll know if you're new, and then show up. And if you see someone there when you're waiting, just uh, introduce yourself to them and take that initiative. 
they'll know that you're nervous, they'll know that you knew, and you'll sit down and they'll just go through a basically a, a meeting where you have a, an MC sort of person called a Toastmaster who will get the meeting started. Then they'll get into a, a phase of this called table topics, where it's a, a one or two minute impromptu answer to a, a, a prearranged question. There will be people pre- giving presentation, presentations, speakers who are moving along in their paths, they call it. There will be people who evaluate these speakers. They'll ask you if you want to jump into table topics. I would say do it. Then there will be reports at the end, people timing the speeches, people talking about the the grammar used, the crutch words. At the end, you as a guest, they will ask you what you thought. They will ask you if you plan on coming back. They'll ask you what it would take for you to come back. And the point of all of that, other than just to spend time without watching TV, right? You, you spend a productive evening without just wasting it. The point of it uh, is for some people to build their confidence, to try out speeches, to try out material. But the number one thing is it helps you to be more mindful of the ways that you might be falling short. You might say, um, too much. If you've listened to my podcast from the beginning, you know that I used to talk really fast and I've slowed down my words so that way they make more sense. You can be mindful of those things we discussed of not saying tons, stuff, people. And I think that those presentations that you give in a place like Toastmasters or on your podcast or on your webinar or in your book is going to be helped so much by this why, what, how to what if formula. And it's not just that. In the book, we talk about a few different formulas that have helped me so much. One is to have smart goals. So if you heard of this concept, smart goals, it means that the goals that you have need to be specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time bound. Smart goals, specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time bound. Specific means that you're going after something tangible. Measurable means that you have a way of testing if you've hit that goal. Actionable means you're doing something that's within your control. So a goal is not, or a smart goal is not make a million dollars, but a smart goal could be make a hundred phone calls. It could be present three webinars. Relevant means that the goal relates to your other goals. It's something that builds your business. It's not just some side project. It's something that relates to other things. And then time bound means that you have a deadline on it. So smart goals is one thing that we cover. We cover this concept called Ikigai, which means that people are always trying to figure out their life purpose. And the the, the meaning of life is Ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I. Ikigai means that the thing that you're doing hits all the boxes of it's something you're skilled at, right? Something you're good at, something that the world needs. So you're solving a real problem. It's something that makes money and it's something that you have a passion about. It's that thing that you love. And looking back early on when all of us were trying to sell to each other, trolling the message boards, copying each other, asking for website critiques. We were in search of, out of all the possible niches, products, solutions, offers, we were looking for Ikigai, the skill, the need, the money, and the love. I have one last link to drop here, and that's podcastcrusher.com. At the moment I'm recording this, we are, actually at the moment I'm recording this, I'm doing our first live class in two years. Lance Tomashiro and I, we got our start doing live webinar class after live webinar class. For some reason, we slowed down on that and we took a two-year break. I mean, we still made money. We still focused on a lot of different things like software and reselling the old courses, but we're back better than ever doing live classes and that's podcastcrusher.com and podcasting as you've listened to me today is just a fun way to get the thoughts out is a fun way to do all the randomness and explore your ideas and, and get your speaking better i want you to have a podcast and i want you to 
solve problems for specific people. And if you're ever uninspired or stuck, then find someone who has a problem and record a podcast episode solving that person's problem. Use the WWHW structure to ensure that it flows right out of you. And make sure that you don't talk to a vacuum, solve someone's real problem. That's how this book in particular flowed out of me. And don't copy each other so much. We, we see this again and again that people just copy what they see online because they, they, they think that, okay, this looks like it's selling. This looks like it works. They've already discovered the person with the problem and they've made a solution, but you don't have the whole picture. If you just copy a product, it's going to fall flat. Instead, find the person with the problem and then create your solution for that problem. And that way, you won't be copying your peers and that way you won't be selling to your peers. And this is a real easy trap to fall into, selling to your peers. This happened when we were stuck in the bubble on, on those message boards where you would see internet marketers and you just try to sell to other internet marketers. You would create a $7 product teaching people how to make a $7 product that would sell $7 products. It, it's, a, it's an endless cycle. Lance and I have taught in the voiceover niche where we teach people how to use their voice, use their microphone, hop on a site called Fiverr and use Fiverr as a traffic source to get paid $50, $100, $500 plus for simple voiceovers. And some people in that course have quit their job. Some people in this course have made four, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month. I'm not saying everyone has, but the people that have applied the right strategy have done that. Meanwhile, you see a lot of people in the voiceover space, instead of teaching a system that works, they try to sell other people voiceover coaching. They say, the reason why you haven't landed any voiceover jobs is because you need to have a, a good demo or I need to teach you how to emote and voice act. And they completely miss the point and they try to sell to each other. Instead, find something new. There's a thing called a red ocean, which is be a copycat and fight for the same crowded space. And then there's a thing called a blue ocean, which means you find a new space, you find a new type of person to compete with. I mean, just think about Tesla and electric cars. If Tesla had tried to make just the same old car, how would that be different? But if they make an electric car, a solar powered car, a self-driving car, that is something new. Think about that. How can you make the new thing, the Tesla or the Uber of your space, and then use WWHW, why, what, how to, what if, to focus on the more important things, to let it flow out of you, and to make it a very smooth listening, reading, watching experience for people because it, it makes storytelling so much fun. It makes the, the flow somehow work. It makes it dead simple, easy to start with a problem, take people on a journey, solve the problem, and then wrap it all up. Why, what, how to, what if? It's the ultimate formula. www.hwbook.com. Get it. You're going to love it. It's on Kindle. It's on paperback. It's on Amazon, ACX Audible, www.hwbook.com. I'm Robert Plank. Check it out. Let me know what you think of the book and bye now. Do you want to be a sponsor for The Robert Plank Show? Make sure to go right now to robertplank.com forward slash ask, fill out the form, and tell us how you'd like to sponsor the show.